Uh, without any further delay, we'll move on to the panel. I'd like to invite our panelists. David, please take your seat. You don't need any additional introduction, I think. No. Um, Dr. Annette Will. Dr. Annette Will. Matters of foreign policy, Israel and the Jewish people. Her opinion articles are going to be published in international publications worldwide. Dr. Wolf served as a member of Knesset in 2010-2013 on behalf of the Labour and Independence Parties, Labour Israeli Party, of course. Media reports revealed she was considered a leading candidate for Israel's ambassador at the UN. She published four books, served as adjustment fellow at the Washington Institute of the Near East Policy, Senior Fellow at the Jewish People Policy Institute, and a Strategic Consultant with McKenzie and Company. And I also had a personal privilege to work with Inat Will for a few diplomatic uh, matters. So, Inat, thank you very much for joining us. Avi Meyer, please. the international spokesman of uh, the Jewish Agency of Israel, the largest Jewish non-profit organization in the world, and, it's, uh, and he is also a spokesman of its chairman, Nathan Sharansky. In 2016, he was named the third most influential person on Jewish Twitter, <laughs> directly behind Jewish Prime Minister Netanyahu. <laughs> and he was recently named one of the most influential English-speaking immigrants in Israeli politics by Jerusalem Post. Born in New York and raised in Jerusalem and Maryland, Meyer has worked for Hillel International, the U.S. House of Representatives, IPAC, and Embassy of Israel in Washington, D.C. Quite impressive. And Dr. Michal Hatuel Radushetsky. <laughs> Dr. Okay. Dr. Hatuel, I will make it shorter, okay? Uh, is a, a research fellow in the team of delegitimatization. De Israelis always have problems with this word. Delegitimatization BDS a program at the Institute of, Inter of National Security Studies, INSS. She is appointed a postdoctoral fellow at the Copper Center, Copper Center of the Study of Antisemitism in the University of Haifa. By the way, I established a program called Ambassadors Online in the same center. Uh, so, Comper Center is very active in combating modern antisemitism. Her research focuses on state stigmatization and on Israel standing in international arena. From 2011 to 2015, she was the Israel representative on, of the Institute of Inclusive Security and managed Forum Dvora, Women in Foreign Policy and National Security. She also was the Director of Foreign Relations in HL Education for Peace, the Geneva Initiative, and managed the European Resource Development Desk at the Center for Jewish Arab Economic Development. Thank you all for joining us. So, um, David, just a quick follow-up. Um, after everything that we hear from you about the Labour Party, you were actively campaigning in the last elections, convincing people in the Jewish community to vote for labor. And if you remember when we met in Oxford last summer, that was the first question I asked you. Yeah. Um, don't you think it's a problem that you basically asking people to bring this, a, I know, anti-Semites or at least controversial characters to power? So what do you think about it? Yeah. I'm a member of the Labour Party, I've been a member of the Labour Party for a long time. Um, I refuse to be pushed out of the Labour Party. I refuse um, to allow the atmosphere of, of, of kind of delegitimization, not of Israel but of me, to allow me to be made politically homeless. I may be politically homeless but I'm going to stay in the Labour Party and I'm going to make my argument. Um, you know, I was at my constituency meeting the other day and I was arguing about Moshe Machover, one of your guys who's been in, Israel, in, in Britain for 40 years who was putting an article around Labour Party conference saying you know that the evidence that the Nazis supported Zionism was that Reinhard Heydrich said in 1935 that they weren't going to kill any Jews. Huh. Right? This was going around my conference. 
So I'm not going to be pushed out, number one. Number two, the Labour Party is not yet done. It is not yet dead. It is a live discussion. There are many people in the Labour Party who are fighting back. The Jewish Labour movement is, you know, is making a fight of it. I don't know if we're going to win or if we're not. I don't know what the time frame is. But um, I don't want to give up. I mean, there's a real issue, actually. And, and we saw this before, for example, in the University and College Union, that there's a... So, the people who resign, <coughs> the people who resign and discuss and say, I'm not going to be a member any longer of a, 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 an anti-Semitic organisation, they get really angry with the people who haven't resigned. And they say, look, I've made this big point and you're still a member. And the people who are still a member are really angry with the people who've resigned because they say, we're still fighting, where are you? We needed your support, we needed your votes, we needed your help. So I think actually for a kind of, a kind of solidarity, really, from the people who resigned and the people who didn't resign, I think is important because, it, because they get really angry with each other and each other is not the, the real enemy. Um, I actually didn't call for a vote for Labour in the last election. What I did was call for a vote for my own uh, local candidate, who's uh, the leader of the Jewish Labour movement campaign within the Labour Party. You know, we can discuss whether he should be standing or whether he shouldn't. Jeremy Newman. Um, that was my vote, and uh, I, you know, I stand by. Jeremy Newmark has been opposing this kind of politics actively and professionally and politically for 25 years, and he's still doing so, and I was very happy to vote for him. The Tory candidate, by the way, lives three doors down from me and is also a friend of mine. So it was you know, a difficult decision. Um, I, throughout the campaign, didn't say anything uh, that wasn't true about Jeremy Corbyn. I was very clear about what I thought about him and his politics. Um, there's a final point which I wanted to make, which of course, in a system like Britain, there are two candidates for Prime Minister. And the Tory candidate was offering an immediate, instant, strong and stable withdrawal of Britain from the European Union. So when one looks at who one's going to vote for, one also looks at, one, at, at what the options are. And it seems to me that the Brexit vote in Britain had much more in common with Jeremy Corbyn and that kind of rise of populist politics, the wish to smash up the post-war democratic consensus in Europe, um, the wish to, for Britain to kind of do itself a damage. Um, so that was also something that I thought was really important. It, it, Theresa May was going to the country asking for a big mandate to put into practice Brexit, and I wasn't prepared to support that either. Yeah, don't you think it's more safer for Jews not to have these people at home? No. I, well, I think there's a real problem for Jews, but I don't think a politics of smashing up the European Union Maybe Le Pen would then have, have become strengthened. Maybe Geert Wilders in the Netherlands would have become strengthened. Maybe, um, you know, many things could have happened in the European Union and might still happen in the European Union. So I think the rise of a nationalist politics and the smashing up of a kind of supranational democratic structure is also very threatening for Jews in Europe. So I think it's a difficult question. And actually, I respect people with a view on either side. I'm taking up too much time, but I can talk more about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, David. And before we continue, there are some seats in the front. If people would like to sit, please. Yeah. Now we're please. here. So yeah. Yeah. Don't be shy. Enat, <laughs> yeah. hey, yeah. um, thank you very much for joining us. And um, uh, you know, when people speak about the anti-Semitism in the left, they usually speak about things like BDS, so they're campaigning against Israel, so they're speaking about human rights, uh, um, imaginary or real uh, allegations, but the point is that it's not similar, one may say, as the anti-Semitism at the right, where you see that there are attacks, physical attacks, skin hits, and so on, and I ask, you know, is it less dangerous than the physical violence that we see on other parties? So first, uh, thank you for uh, putting this together. And thank you for an excellent book. Um, 
I want to highlight uh, first what happens to a person of the left who begins to recognize why all of this is problematic and dangerous. And I thought it was very interesting, and I don't know if you were aware of, uh, I think, how it ties the book together. You started with the discussion of Shylock mm -hmm. in your book. And one of the terms that I started using in recent years to talk about people on the left who find themselves increasingly excluded <laughs> from various groups is that they're under tremendous social pressure to give over a pound of flesh. And what all Jews discover, as they have always known, is that no amount of pounds of flesh is ever enough. And in many ways, I think every person of the left, uh, and I still very much consider myself of the left, every person of the left who wakes up to this issue has this moment of pound of flesh. Where, for example, you think, you described it in your book, I belong. So, I was a member of the Labour Party, supporter of two states, supposedly checking the boxes of what is okay on the left, right? I'm cool, I'm good. And I gave a talk quite a few years ago to the Europe to the socialist members of the European Parliament, right? Pretty much the epitome of the political left, the socialist members of the European Parliament. And I noticed, and I thought to my, the, I thought to myself very naively, they are my colleagues. I'm of the socialist Labour Party in Israel. They are the socialist politicians of Europe, colleagues, right? And. I realized as I was describing myself very naturally as a labor Zionist, I literally noticed that they cringed by merely my using the word Zionism. And by the end of my talk, I realized that nothing stood for me, being a lab member of the Labor Party, supporter of two states, all that. Being a Zionist, I might as well put up myself all the way on the right side of the European Parliament of the crazy fascists. And I remember also once giving a talk, and again, expressing my left-wing political views in Israel. But then I was met with such hatred and virulence of discussion about Israel. And at one point, I kind of stepped back and said, this can't be all about the settlements, right? Like, that hatred, that feeling that comes from the gut, it, so these, big, these were the, and I think almost every person of the left who wakes up to this kind of anti-Semitism has this moment of a pound of flesh. And then the question you are then asked is, do you give over that pound of flesh? Or do you take a step back, risking exclusion? A lot of Jews give over the pound of flesh. There is tremendous pressure on the left, and you are right, increasingly on the right, to give over the pound of flesh and to say, okay, in the past it was enough to say that we support two states. Now we need to say that we're anti-Israeli. Now we need to show that we really hate Israel. Every time the bar is raised to how much you need to demonstrate that you belong to the good kind of Jew rather than the bad Zionist, right? This is how this whole process works separate the good Jew from the bad Zionist, and slowly, slowly you can isolate them. And I think the people you see here are people who took a step back and said, enough. I don't want to give over any more pounds of flesh. Enough. And you kind of stake your position and you're saying, from here on, I have nothing to talk with you about. I still hold on to my political views my policies, what I think is right for Israel, but I am not going to be part of the game that is far more dangerous. And why is it dangerous? Because the way that the anti-Semitism on the left operates is still using the same ideas. It basically posits Israel, Zionism, and thereby Jews as the ultimate evil. And it does so by something they call uh, the placard strategy, right? 
Uh, you've seen it at all of the anti-Israel demonstrations. They all hold placards. What did these placards say? Israel, Zionism, sometimes they just settle for the Star of David. Equation sign, equals. Now, I'm sure it's going to come as a shock to you. I have yet to see a placard that says Zionism equals the political movement for self-determination of the Jewish people <laughs> and their ancient homeland, right? Great placard. Uh, the strategy has been so effective that all of you lovers of Israel and Zionism know what the equation says. You know the list. Apartheid, racism, Nazism, genocide, colonialism, imperialism. And the placard strategy is employed everywhere not just in anti-Israel demonstrations. Give an anti-Israel speaker 30 seconds on television, regardless of the question, they'll manage to say apartheid, colonialism, genocide, racism in the answer. <laughs> so it's a very effective strategy. It's made it into the brains of a whole lot of people. And the words are chosen. Those who employ the strategy say, well, we say apartheid because Israel's apartheid. We say genocide because Israel's committing genocide. I once had a meeting with a um, Sinn Féin member of parliament in Ireland. And it was, he said, it was just after Gaza. And he said, it's a shame the genocide that Israel's committing in Gaza. <laughs> and I was like, um, no. And you know, if what Israel is doing in Gaza were genocide, we would have about 10 million more Jews today. And, and he said, well, we'll agree to disagree. And I was like, no, 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 no. This is not an agree to disagree situation. Yes, genocide, no genocide. And of course, at the end, they kind of threw me out of the room. But, um, <laughs> but, but this makes it into the minds of members of, I mean, this, is, this doesn't stay on placards. It is hugely dangerous. And why is it dangerous? Because all of these words were chosen not because they reflect reality. They're chosen because by now they are considered universally to connote evil. And as a result, what people are being subjected to is this refrain that says, Israel, Zionism, Star of David, equal evil. Israel, Zionism, Star of David, equal evil. That's the refrain. Now, why is that dangerous? Because people, unless they're psychopaths, and happily this is still the minority in our world, do not engage in acts of mass violence or extreme violence unless they believe it is for a good cause. No tank ever moves, no plane ever moves, no bomb is ever dropped if the people doing it don't think that what they're doing is for the good. <coughs> now there is no greater good in the world than the eradication of evil, by definition, right? So if you think about it, the world's greatest atrocities were always preceded by the preparations of people's minds that the mass violence they're about to engage in is for the good. And the greater the violence, the more you need to argue that it is for the good. And the greater the violence the need, the more it has to be the ultimate good. And the ultimate good is the eradication of evil. And this is basically what we're seeing in this process. It's not an academic debate. It's not just about the social pressure. It's about the preparations of people's minds for mass violence by presenting Israel, Zionism, and Jews as the ultimate evil, and therefore the eradication of that evil as the ultimate good, which therefore should be done by any means necessary. And so what can be the next step? Well, now I'm trying to understand because I, I spoke a lot about a, a, about Israel on campuses, and then people say, "Well, you know, we we think that Israel is a part of the state, so it's not a big deal." Uh, you want to find racists? Racists are people who are hitting uh, Muslims on the streets. Uh, so. My question is, why it is so, so dangerous in your perception? What, what could be the next uh, step? What could be the result of what you say? Well, the result is precisely what I said. This is an invitation to mass violence. How exactly is the form that it takes? Mm -hmm. Who exactly ultimately takes the violence? Does it against, in what form? I don't know. But 
once you prepare people's minds, mm -hmm. once you create that intellectual, mental environment that says, you are about to do good. You are about to do something noble. A world without Israel is a good world. A world without Zionists is a better world. A world, therefore, without Jews who are all Zionists is a better world. And that is, again, a classic anti-Semitic vision. The vision of a world without Jews, of a utopia. That the Jews are what stands between us and utopia. That is a very ancient anti-Semitic idea. Um, sometimes when I speak, you say to young people who are like, what are you talking about? And they're like, in Israel, why do you insist in this 21st century on the idea of a supremacist state only for Jews, this nationalism, this, this is like so passe, it's so 21st century. Who still like insists on a nation only for their own? So over time, I just decided I developed the following answer. I told him, you know what? I share your vision of a John Lennon world. I want to live in a world with no borders, no religion, all of humanity living as one. It's just that I get very suspicious when you ask the Jews to go first. <laughs> and um, and, and I, I found that this sometimes begins to get to them, because people come with all these grand utopias, grand ideas. It's just that Israel and Zionism and the Jews somehow are the problem. And I even offer them a deal. I tell them, you know what, we'll play ball. There are 200 countries in the world. We'll be number 100, forming in the middle. When 99 countries open their borders, forgo any national symbols, any sense of kind of nation, being, group identity, when 99 countries in the world will do that, we'll play ball. But the notion that we, we are the singular uh, thing that stands between the world and this John Lennon utopia, it's merely a new mutation of a very ancient theme. When you see, for example, all these efforts to get Israel out of FIFA, out of that, what is it really all about? It's about creating the image of a world without Israel. Look, isn't it so much nicer? Isn't it so much better to work without Israel, without Zionists, without Jews? So how exactly, ultimately, people will execute that vision? There's a whole variety of ways these days. But the key is that this vision is being created, being prepared, and being given a real texture and form that people can literally feel and therefore desire and ultimately act. Thank you, Imad. Definitely there is much to worry about. Um, I, actually, I work as a tour guide, and a few years ago I had a, a family that I guided from the United States, and they were in Jerusalem speaking about Herzl, and the small kid asked me, David, what is Zionism that you're speaking about? And his, uh, his father really did answer, a Zionist is an extremist Jew. So uh, there's some kind of branding, and that branding goes exactly to what I not said. Mm. I would like to move on to Avi and Michal. Avi, you are speaking for the Jewish Agency and for Nathan Sharansky. So you are the professional organization, representing the professional organization that aims to help people in Europe and worldwide to combat this phenomena. And um, so my question would be, first of all, how? Um, is the Jewish agency defining anti-Semitism? Where does the criticism of Israel cross the legitimate border? And also, uh, what the Jewish agency can do in order to help Jewish communities worldwide to uh, answer this challenge? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I have to say, I'm not unaccustomed to being the least uh, impressive person on the panel, but uh, being the only person at all on the stage without a doctorate is a new experience. <laughs> um, you know, when I'm asked to define anti-Semitism, I'm reminded uh, of a comment made in 1964 by the U.S. Supreme Court Justice uh, Potter Stewart, who was asked to define uh, pornography. And he said, I'm not going to get into definitions, but I know it when I see it. 
Um, and I think that that's largely true of anti-Semitism as well. I think we all have a sense of what anti-Semitism is when we see it. Um, but at the same time, I do think that definitions have a purpose. Um, and I was reminded of this uh, actually just last night. Um, I was having a conversation uh, in advance of this panel. I was talking to a friend uh, who happens to work uh, for a Western government. Um, and I was saying that I'm going to a panel, the title of which is Anti-Semitism in the European Left Wing. And he looked at me, he gave a sort of quizzical look and said, you know, I, I have a lot of friends in left circles. I was in a left circle myself. I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, what? He said, I, I've never experienced anti-Semitism on the left. And I looked at him and I said, well, I guess that sort of depends on how you define anti-Semitism. We, we started this conversation about definitions of anti-Semitism. At the end, he said, oh, actually, I know what you're talking about. Actually, there's quite a bit of that uh, in, on the left. And so um, we at the Jewish Agency are fortunate to be led by Natan Sharansky, who is, of course, a hero of the Jewish people, um, and who in 2004 developed what he refers to as the three Bs, um, which are a useful formulation for um, differentiating legitimate criticism of Israel from anti-Semitism. And the three Bs are as follows. They are delegitimization, demonization, and double standards. If you try to undermine Israel's very right to exist, if you claim that the Jews alone out of all nations do not have a right to self-determination, that is delegitimization and that is anti-Semitic. If you portray, as Einat was just saying, Israel as the ultimate evil, the manifestation of evil on earth, akin to Nazism, apartheid, and all that, that is demonization, and that too is anti-Semitism. And if you hold Israel to a standard that you won't hold any other country to, if you say that what is acceptable for other countries is uniquely unacceptable for the Jewish state, as we see very often, that too is anti-Semitism. And so those three Ds have been formulated, they've been used in various uh, forums. Um, we did see them integrated uh, into the EU definition of anti-Semitism uh, in a certain way. We saw them integrated into the way the State Department defines anti-Semitism, and we've seen it most recently in the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism. Um, Natan Sharansky has been going around the world um, talking to governments about the importance of integrating a working definition of anti-Semitism into their uh, national modes of operation. Um, we are very, uh, I, I don't want to say happy, but we are pleased to see that uh, several governments have formally adopted the IRA, IHRA um, definition of anti-Semitism in the UK. Right. I'm sorry? They are adopted as instructions for police, but not as part of a legal system, right? They've been adopted by the governments um, as a useful tool for defining anti-Semitism when it arises. They have not been legislated. Um, there's not an effort to somehow suppress free speech, but it is a way for governments to determine what is or is not anti-Semitic. And so the government of the United Kingdom, the government of Germany, of Austria, have uh, all adopted this definition. Um, and we've seen that there are other efforts uh, afoot as well. Um, as for your question on how we at the Jewish Agency and how Jewish communities can combat this, look, I think that what we saw, what we've seen in recent years has been of tremendous concern. I actually was also in Paris um, in July of 2014 um, under different circumstances. And I remember speaking to uh, Jewish students. I went to a dinner at Chabad um, in the center of Paris. It's frequented by many Jewish students. And uh, I asked them, you know, what are their plans? What do they see their future? And every single one of them said that they plan to leave France. Not a single one, not a single Jewish student I spoke to that night said they planned to remain in France. Some said they wanted to make Aliyah, some said they wanted to go elsewhere, but that was a real wake-up call for me. And in fact, what we've seen in recent years is that there has been a significant increase in Aliyah from France. Um, in 2014, 2015, Aliyah uh, from France reached uh, really the, the, I think the pinnacle of what it had ever been before. Um, and it was actually the first time in the history of the State of Israel that more than 1% of a country's Jewish population made Aliyah in a single year. Um, we've actually since seen those numbers taper off to some extent, but that is one response to anti-Semitism. Um, we actually saw it, we saw the numbers start to rise in the aftermath of the horrific attack at the Jewish school in Toulouse in 2012, and it reached the pinnacle in 2014-2015. 
Um, do you see any solution except Aliyah? I do, in fact. Um, our view on Aliyah is that we want people to come here out of a sense of attachment and belonging. Frankly, we want them to come here because they want to be here, not because they're running away. And so we at the Jewish Agency do whatever we can to strengthen Jewish life in Jewish communities around the world, particularly today in Europe. Um, in the aftermath of the attack in 2012, we actually created a designated fund uh, to help Jewish communities provide for their physical security so that Jewish life can continue apace even under threat. Um, and what we're seeing is that Jewish life is in fact going stronger in certain places. And anti actually, anti-Semitism, to some extent, is declining. In Germany, for example, there were fewer anti-Semitic incidents in 2016 than there were in the previous year. The same is true of France. In the UK, the numbers are going up. And so it's sort of a mixed bag, and there are different uh, responses by different Jewish communities. But while we certainly would like Jews to make Aliyah, that is at the core of our activities, we do think that it should come from a position of strength, and so we will do whatever is possible to strengthen Jewish life in Jewish communities around the world. Thank you very much, Abby. Thank you. So um, when I was preparing this panel and I spoke with uh, Michal by phone, um, they did an impressive work in INSS about uh, uh, composing uh, recommendations for policymakers on uh, how to deal with the rise of anti-Semitism and uh, BDS and delegitimization. Delegi sorry, uh, again, it's hard work for Israelis. Um, I'm a, and I started to speak with Michal about BDS, and uh, she told me that they don't necessarily see BDS as anti-Semitism. And I'm curious, after all what we hear here, um, how would you define um, non-anti-Semitic BDS? <laughs> and also, um, if you could uh, please, um, from the viewpoint of the a research center share some of your recommendations to the Israeli authorities and also maybe a question that I'm putting in there if anyone wants to answer also is it an Israeli problem? So yesterday I was sitting with my family and speaking about this panel they told me listen you're wasting your time just have a solution they can come to Israel so is it an Israeli problem? Anyone if uh if you would like us to answer to that question, about the mic. Okay. <clears throat> wow. What an introduction. Uh, so thank you for the question, and it's been absolutely exquisite listening to all of my colleagues here. Um, I'll start off with the uh, BDS uh, equals or doesn't equal anti-Semitism. Um, right, and this view may not be very traditional, and I may have some uh, backlash here from <coughs> panelists. I wouldn't say, and here maybe I'll plug into uh, David Hirsch's nice analogy about a WhatsApp uh, or a, an app that says this is uh, anti-Semitic or this isn't anti-Semitic. I don't think that you can say that BDS is anti-Semitic because BDS is not one person. And even if it were one person, I'm not sure I would like to be in a position to categorize that person he is or he isn't, to kind of brand a person as anti-Semitic or not. BDS comprises of a lot of people with a lot of views. I would even say maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of people. And all those people, you can't look at them as a monolithic block, right? Some people support BDS because they're truly anti-Semitic, they hate Israel, they hate Jews, doesn't matter what you say, doesn't matter what you do, it's a lost battle. But other people support BDS because they think that is what will bring the two-state solution. Others will support BDS because they're pro-peace and they see the Middle East peace process is stuck and they think maybe this is the one thing that's going to make a difference. Other people support BDS because they don't have a clue what it is. But they think that, you know, they identify with the underdog, and in this case, that's the underdog, and they with it. And maybe it doesn't even demand so much just putting a little logo on Facebook or whatever. So, yeah, why not? Solidarity, global good. Other people, they support BDS because they don't really support BDS. They support LGBTQ, or they support Black Lives Matter, and that platform says that BDS is good, so they're going for BDS as well. It's like a one thing. 
uh, it plugs into other narratives. And I, that is why I, don't, I wouldn't paintbrush all BDS supporters as anti-Semitic. More so, I think it's not in our interest to say that everyone who supports BDS is anti-Semitic for three reasons. First off, again, it says, well, if BDS is anti-Semitic, it leaves us with a very depleted toolbox. Because, well, if it's anti-Semitic, then we have nothing to do. Then we can, you know, bang our head against the wall. It doesn't make a difference. If they're anti-Semitic, they're going to hate us no matter what we do. It's a lost battle. Second, those people that are sitting on the fence or that have, you know, they've joined the BDS narrative because they're not really clued up on what's happening, but it's what their friend's doing. When, when our answer to them is that, well, oh, you're anti-Semitic, it furthers them from our cause. In, instead of engaging them, instead of explaining to them, these people are saying, well, I know I'm not an anti-Semite, but because I can't open my mouth and say Israel's doing bad things, I'm, I'm labeled as an anti-Semite, so then there's obviously no dialogue there. And third, phenomena like Linda Sarsour, who is an activist, who is a feminist, and he's an outspoken BDS supporter, also uh, shows how intricate and complex the situation is when she was the first to raise uh, uh, money, funds, for Jewish cemeteries that were uh, uh, sabotaged, desecrated, thanks to the word, um, in different areas in the United States. And then she can come out, now it's fine, the funds never came through and whatever, but the and person general, on the street... Exactly, it does make a difference. But it's very easy to negate that dialogue and that very specific kind of, you know, slogan, BDS is anti-Semitism, with a complex phenomena like Linda Sassur, she's Muslim, she's pro-BDS, but here she is raising funds from um, Muslim communities to um, rehabilitate Jewish uh, cemeteries, whatever. For the, uh, sorry for interrupting. What will, what will be your mechanism to define what is anti-Semitic and what is not? I don't have a mechanism. I don't have a mechanism, and I'm thinking, what good will that mechanism do? I draw, I, I'm thinking what's important here is to think how to engage and not to further people, not to say, you're anti-Semitic, you're not with us. Rather say, you know what? Maybe you're not even sure what anti-Semitism is. Maybe you think you're anti-Semitic, but you, you don't even know what you're speaking about. Have you ever been to Israel? Let's talk. Let's engage in dialogue. I think that's plugging into that narrative, you know, anti-Semitism, BDS, they are all out the door. It, it plays into their hands because what we want to do is the opposite. We don't want to boycott the boycotters. We want to engage in dialogue. I think that's our strength. I think we have what to say. We have a message, we have, you know, things to show, and we have our own narrative. The thing is, our narrative, and here I'm linking to what I now said, our narrative is complex. Our narrative is not free, free Gaza, free, free Palestine, Israel is apartheid. And because we engage in that narrative, we don't have the luxury of boycotting people, of saying, of paintbrushing everyone, paintbrushing everyone is anti-Semitic. Um, so that's my answer regarding the BDS, <laughs> regarding the, the research that we did. So, at I... Uh, about the recommendation to the policy, to the policy makers. To the policy makers? Uh, okay, I'll speak about that too. <clears throat> so the research uh, was conducted at the beginning of last year, for between January and uh, June 2016. Uh, since then we've established a team that looks at delegitimization and BDS is only part of delegitimization because delegitimization, and again I'm, I'm linking to uh, Ennard Wilf's um, um, kind of idea of preparation of minds. I think what Ennard spoke about is, is, the, is, the, is the hardcore academic definition of delegitimization. It's morally outcasting a person or a group of people to justify violence. That's, that's the next step. So that's what we're looking at in general, and BDS is, is one manifestation of that phenomena. Um, so what we did, and also just, um, okay, I want to refer to also what you said regarding how do you, you know, how do you know when it's anti-Semitism or not. So we, our kind of line, when we, again, I think it's very important to contain uh, criticism about Israel and not to kind of just uh, dismiss it. 
but to learn from it and to engage. And how do I know when it's criticism or when it's delegitimization or maybe anti-Semitism? Is when uh, the right of the Jewish people to self-determination is questioned. That is where I draw the line. Because when, uh, and I don't want to compare us to awful states that do awful things, but when other awful things are done, no one questions other states' um, right to exist, right? But when they say, you know, Israel doesn't have a right to exist, that's, that taps into delegitimization, and those people are not people that I can engage in dialogue with. Um, so back to the research, what we did is we looked at the phenomena of, of BDS, um, how it manifests itself in different fields, economically, uh, lawfare, um, narrative, media, and so forth, in different regions in the world. Um, some were done from open media sources, others were done with uh, interviews. Uh, we looked at uh, United States, Canada, South Africa, Europe, um, and different areas. And what we learned um, in general about what, what this phenomena is. Firstly, BDS, anti-Israel, is, uh, is a networked phenomena. They are, it's not a hierarchical uh, kind of organization. They networked, it's uh, in different languages, in different places, it's all over the world. Uh, some places more than others. Um, the idea, again, is a lot of solidarity kind of expressing solidarity, uh, taps into the South African struggle to abolish apartheid. Um, a lot of um, uh, work, very strategic work with the media, inflating numbers, uh, attributing developments that happened in the world to BDS successes. One of the most prominent examples is the European Commission's um, uh, policy of labeling products made in the West Bank has nothing to do with BDS. As the European uh, ambassador to Israel has said over every single platform that the European Union does not support BDS. Doesn't make a difference to them, of course. Um, so, so a very also a, a sophisticated media strategy. Um, and um, on our side, what we we also had a look at counter BDS struggle. Uh, what we saw is a very disorganized camp uh, with a lot of different opinions, uh, which is obviously also very different. I, I won't go back to the narrative, very, the BDS next, very uniform narrative. Uh, so the, the, the other side, the, the counter BDS, has a very um, different, diverse narrative, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It, it can be a very good thing. Sorry? Exactly. Things. Which is not, uh, again, I think that it's a strength. The problem is when, when we start um, having divisions and, and politics inside the camp, because some people will uh, criticize Israel and others will mm -hmm. say, you know, I don't live in Israel, I don't send my kids to the IDF, so I don't have a bad word to say about Israel. And then there's intricacies inside the camp. And then there's coalitions, and then there's certain organizations that won't be in the coalition, and that, in general, weakens the camp. Um, we came into the game late. Uh, this has been going on for many years and uh, in Israel it was recognized very late. So it's a pro-Israel kind of campaign started many years afterwards, at least in an organized fashion. There's a kind of a feeling that uh, we're putting out fires, um, maybe, uh, in, in, maybe it, it's, it's starting to become more strategic now, but uh, but that's quite a recent development. Um, and our recommendations, uh, well, they vary. Um, to the government, I would say, or to the, the policy establishment, uh, BDS is, is a, is a people-to-people, it's a, it's a people struggle. It's a, it's, a, it's a civil society struggle. And when government counters or even relates to civil society, it can be very problematic. And this taps into their whole policy of inflating numbers, inflating their successes. So when you have a student council uh, in London uh, passing a BDS resolution, and you have the Prime Minister of Israel uh, 
putting on a, a YouTube uh, clip and uh, you know kind of answering them, that does a lot of damage to to the struggle, to the pro-Israel struggle, because that gives them that that elevates them from being here to being there, because any a boycott res resolution that's adopted by any student council doesn't, uh, is not necessarily and is not and hasn't been to date adopted officially by any university. So when you have something informal by civil society and then you have the, the top of the, the top echelon of the Israeli establishment uh, reacting, it, it just elevates them to a different, to a different playground. So the idea of establishing the ministries about this topic so, is not a good idea. It's not necessarily, uh, no, I didn't say that. I, don't, I think it's a good idea because I think Israel does need to be organized. The question is how the ministry works. And if you see a recent example with a, an NBA delegation that was coming to Israel, and as soon as they found out that the ministry or the government funding was involved in bringing them, it backfired. And the media coverage of it was that some people came, some people didn't come, there was a whole controversy. So, so the government needs to be involved in specific things uh, under the radar. Um, for one of the things, for example, is polls. We spoke to, in the research, I spoke to a lot of Jew Jewish organizations, and not, not, not necessarily only Jewish, but organizations that are in the front lines of countering BDS. They don't have the means and the, and the, and the funds to conduct polls. And polls are something that the government of Israel can conduct and can share the information with the local organizations. Um, another thing, for example, is we see, again, in, in those regions, the people in the front lines are university kids. They go to university and they go with their play cards and they try to also kind of answer this awful delegitimization phenomena. And uh, they often uh, kind of hugged by the um, uh, different organizations and they come to Israel for excursions, to strengthen them, to show them Israel, etc. The government can meet officials, the Israeli officials can meet with these kids and, and strengthen them and mo motivate them. There's plenty of other things that, that the government can do. One of the, one of the things that we've realized, uh, again, research shows, that is counterproductive is when Israel tries to take the four in, uh, in legislature as well, even the last bill from March that is an amendment to the law uh, regarding who can and who cannot enter Israel and pro-BDS uh, supporters can't enter Israel and then there's a whole dialogue about who is pro-BDS I mean it's, not, it's that same thing is that where, where does the line cross you pro-BDS or you're not pro-BDS and what good does that do other than again a lot of media coverage a lot of discourse about Israel being democratic or not being democratic and comparison to other states that have same legislature and um, so Israel needs to be very, official Israel needs to be very careful and very strategic in the struggle, in countering something that's civil society. I'm not saying don't do anything, it's important to do something, but, but it needs to be well thought out, well thought out. And finally, the, what, what obviously also uh, we, we realize in speaking to these people in the, in the frontline organizations countering BDS, is that what happens in Israel, and I think we all know this, but sometimes it feels like the people in the government don't. What happens in Israel doesn't stay in Israel. So if we have a minister speaking, you know, very bluntly and aggressively about uh, Palestinians or about Arabs in Israel, it does us a great disservice. You know, it may be good for the local constituents on that Thursday, but afterwards it's very bad for Israel. So, kind of to, to definitely differentiate between uh, those two different audiences. Thank you very much, Michal. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan. We are sorry. Wow. Uh, we are going to open the floor for questions <coughs> in very short uh, time. Uh, I just want, I would like to give our speakers a right of reply. But when you think about your questions, please. Uh, make sure that your question is a question and not a statement. <laughs> Meaning, if it's more than three sentences, it's a problem. And try to avoid the internal political debate in Israel because we are speaking about anti-Semitism abroad. So to try to think about it just a second. I would like to give our speakers the right to reply to the thing that we already heard. Very quick, one minute, okay? Sure. It's, it's not a reply so much as the break is due. 
Um, and I, I spend a lot of time hanging out with BDS folks uh, on the interwebs. Um, <clears throat> and in my experience, BDS leaders tend to be well-informed and ill-intentioned, and BDS supporters tend to be well-intentioned and ill-informed. And this is something that works to the leader's favor, because there's something very appealing about BDS. It feels like something that you, wherever you are, can do in perhaps a passive way by simply abstaining for buying Israeli products to bring about peace in the Middle East. I understand how that can be appealing to someone. And so we have to go about explaining why BDS is in fact a toxic movement, a toxic effort with very pernicious aims, which is something that the leaders say very openly. Omar Barhouti is very open about his desire to see a world without Israel. Other leaders of the BDS movement are extremely open about this. There are quotes galore that state this very, very clearly. And I think that's something we need to make, we need to make clear. Um, and I think your point about uh, anti-Semitism is also very important. Um, I think a lot of people define themselves as anti-Zionists not actually having any idea what that means. Um, in my experience, a lot of people who call themselves anti-Zionists are simply critics of Israeli government policy. And I would guess that there's probably no one in this room who is not at some point critical of Israeli government policy. Does that make us all anti-Zionists? Of course not. That's nonsense. And so I think what we need to do is actually put some effort into defining what Zionism is and what anti-Zionism means. It is a very significant, a very profound ideological statement to say I am an anti-Zionist. I think it is indisputably an anti-Semitic statement. I can't see any way that it is not. Um, and we have to make sure that we are that we are educating those who actually do define themselves as anti-Zionists without knowing what that means and who actually are critical of Israeli policy and tell them that's okay. It's okay to be critical of Israeli policy. Most Israelis are at any given time. But you can get on board with the concept of a Jewish state just as you can get on board with the concept of any other nation having self-determination in the world. So I admit to being torn between the kind of uh, views that Michal represents and in many ways I employ in my ongoing work. I engage, I speak with people, I don't blame them for things. Uh, I try to point out, I try to be very rational, I try to show them that their good intentions are better served elsewhere. But then sometimes, and especially given some uh, attitudes, I veer to, and if anyone knows me politically, it's not a person I ever quote, but here he seemed to get it. Um, Yair Lapid once said that, uh, you know, um, her, we probably didn't get it right about the state of Israel solving anti-Semitism. That was Herzl's vision, of course. But what we do have today is the opportunity to tell anti-Semites to shove it. And, and I thought, and sometimes I sincerely find myself in that position where I am done engaging and I'm done explaining and I just want to tell them to shove it. Um, and, and there is this question of when you are talking, and, and this is really the issue, because maybe the supporters of BDS are not anti-Semitic, but the structure very much is. And yes, perhaps some people through rational processes can see that and therefore decide to disengage. But we are battling against two civilizations that, are, that have that at their core. They are predicated on that. And this is why anti-Semitism, and Ruth Wise said it recently very well, it's a political strategy. Anti-Semitism is not a definition, it's not an attitude, it's not a moral stance. It's a political strategy, an effective political strategy for creating alliances across groups who normally would not be caught dead with each other. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why it's so effective. When you showed the red-green alliance and everyone said, how weird is it? Well, it comes from this. Why did anti-Semitism increase in the left? Because the Soviet Union collapsed, and the left suddenly realized that it's weak. What do you do when you're weak? You don't have an empire behind you? Well, you create alliances with other rising forces. The Muslims are rising across Europe, even across America. They come from a civilization predicated upon the notion that the Jews should be headed to the dustbin of history. 
it's an opportunity for people in those two civilizations to create alliances that they normally would not do to their political views. So we, we do need to understand that, yes, we need to employ all the nice strategies, and seriously, that's what I do most of my days, but the other part is also about just being the powerful people that we are today with the ability to tell the anti-Semites to shove it. We, we can't do all the nice things we're doing without having at least the back opportunity of being a strong nation, a strong country, and a strong people who at least now are not cowed by these uh, things. David, I remember that you wrote in your article a, about antisemitism as social phenomena that uh, people use anti-Semitic motives to mobilize others for their goal. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what is a not saying, but you did not really mention it precisely about politics, but in general, right? The, the, the question of whether BDS is anti-Semitic, I think, is a much more complicated question than asking, is this or that person who supports it in this or that way themselves anti-Semitic? It's not a personal moral failing. I mean, as a sociologist, you can answer the question about BDS in a number of ways. One question you can ask is, well, so as a sociologist, it's an empirical question, right? You can look at a union or a church or a political party in which the BDS movement becomes important and you can see what the effect is. I don't know, you know, I have no insight into the inner heart of Jeremy Corbyn or of Linda Sassoul, but you can easily show that when BDS comes into a union or into a party, it brings with it anti-Semitic discourse, it brings with it a way of thinking about uh, Israelis and then about the Jews who are accused of supporting them, which are really poisonous. Um, let me give you one of, just a couple of quick stories. Um, we have an introductory, very cool, right, one story. We have an introductory <laughs> meeting for our new students, right? And we, the student union guy comes in and he, he says, we're a student union, we run political campaigns. At the moment we're running three campaigns. We're running a campaign against fascism, a campaign against student fees, and a campaign against the occupation. And then he moves on to talk about sports clubs. Now, no, I look around the room, right? Nobody asks which occupation. Nobody asks <coughs> why this occupation. Now, in itself, there's nothing pernicious or nothing wrong or nothing illegitimate about running a campaign against the occupation. If you ask me to join a campaign against the occupation, I'm very happy to join a campaign against the occupation. But what this is, is 18-year-old students being invited to construct their political identity the moment they arrive at university around Israel and Palestine and around the Jews. And actually, the pound of flesh, by the way, the pound of flesh is are you willing to say that the people who raise the issue of anti-Semitism are doing so to silence criticism of Israel? That's the, the real um, telling moment. So, so um, it's really difficult. You know, the, the, the anti-Semitic culture is made up of bits and discourse and ways of thinking which are not in themselves necessarily problematic. Um, what I try to do in the book is to say it's an empirical question. Let's look at what it brings with us. What does BDS bring with us? What does it specifically bring with us when students are invited to construct their whole political identity around Israel and Palestine? And by the way, people who've been constructing their identity in relation to the Jews for a very, very long time since the beginning of Christianity. And many things that happen around BDS mirror older kinds of anti-Semitism. Um, anti-Semitism always said that the Jews are central to everything bad that happens in the world. So when you construct Israel and the issue of anti-Semitism as being central to your political identity, when you construct Zionism as a key evil on the planet, then you're already very close to older anti-Semitic 
ways of centering the Jews. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. And we'll open the floor for questions. Yes. Ambassador, please. Could you take the mic? Oh, okay. Um, what do I need, Mike? No, no, no. question to Dr. Hirsch. Uh, you <laughs> say... Uh, that will be my dad. Go on, go out. <laughs> doctor, doctor. Um, you say you think Corbyn really thinks that he's not anti -Semitic. Yes. So why then, day in, day out, he's given opportunities, not to prove that he's not anti but a little sop here and a yeah. sop there, and he never takes them, and he does the opposite. Was it really necessary for a, the, the, the letter about uh, Machover to come out from his personal office? Yeah. Is that cock up or conspiracy? Yeah. What's got, you know, I mean, is he, is he, is he in a prisoner, a prisoner of his you know, moments and all the other groups that are supporting yeah. him? Or perhaps you're wrong and he actually is No, I, I think it's very, very clear that Jeremy Corbyn believes himself to be an opponent of anti Semitism. I think it's at the very core of his being. Right? And Linda Sassel and many other of these people. And that's part of the strength of BDS and hostility to Israel is that it's, it's represented by people who have a very clean conscience. Right? But objectively, you can show what comes out of what they do. Now, I do think Jeremy Corbyn likes to uh, do a little baiting of the Zionists. Yes, I, yes. I think he, he, he gets excited about that. I think he knows that it will do him no harm. He knows it will strengthen his base. He's learned that it doesn't do him much damage otherwise. And, you know, he likes that, but he doesn't think of himself in any sense as anti-Semitism, as anti-Semitic, and he, he's very angry with the people who suggest that he is. And he's, he's genuinely very angry. So I think we need, a, you know, the sociology of race and racism has moved on. It's about, you know, institutions and discourses and norms. Racism isn't usually a result of hostility to, to black people or to Muslims or whatever. It's usually about something much more subtle and sophisticated and difficult to get at. Because, you know, racism is against everybody's dominant ideology. So, so... Um, <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, Madame in the second line, please. Um, I don't really need it, but hello. Okay, my question is to Ian Atanavi, really. Just, Theodore Herzl did say that once Israel it was a state for the Jewish people, that anti Semitism would disappear. And I'm interested in whether you think that could have been true, or whether he was totally misguided in thinking that that was possible. And also, Basically, if that could have been true, then has Israel been very remiss in allowing this build-up of anti-Israel anti feeling and anti-Zionism over the last 20 years? For example, my friend who's 10 years older than me, when he went to school after the 67 war, people were patting him on the shoulder and saying, well done. Mm -hmm. So in the late 60s, up to about the mid-70s, Israel was really seen as gutsy with the raid on Entebbe, the 67 war, the 73 war, Eichmann in the early 60s, etc. I'm interested in whether you think Israel could have done more in speaking out the way you're speaking out now over the last 20 years, or whether you think that Herzl's idea was never really going to sort of do away with anti-Semitism. Thank you. And uh, I will also add whether the governmental efforts still today were efficient, in your opinion. So again, I'm torn. Fundamentally, I think Herzl was wrong. I don't think he could have moved forward without thinking he was right. I mean, I think the utopian idea of not only are we helping ourselves, but we will be curing the world of its ills was necessary to mobilizing support for Zionism. But I've often struggled with the question, what would Herzl say if he realized that at the end of the day, no, anti-Semitism anti merely mutated to this kind of anti-Zionism. And that's when I go to this idea of, well, at least we have the opportunity to tell the anti-Semites to shove it. So we did achieve something in our ability to be self-sufficient and powerful and know that we are no longer completely at the mercy of anti-Semites, which is, despite everything, a step forward, and we are incredibly grateful 
to Herzl and others for that. Um, this is not to say that nothing can be done. We are working within deep civilizational structures. I think one of the depressing things for any person growing up is to realize how deep it is. When I discuss the sources of the conflict, a lot of people, I mean, to talk about Arab and Muslim views of Jews, no one talks about that. And that's the source of the conflict. The notion that the Jews cannot be the political equals of Arabs and Muslims. The simplest explanation for why the conflict endures is the one that no one <coughs> ever uses. And when, when, so we're working against civilizational structures. And when I raise it to people, how do I explain to them, especially young people? I tell them, look, young men and women sitting in this room, if I were telling the men here that you think women are your inferiors because they bear children, you will be horrified. So you're right. People are horrified by the notion that they're racist, chauvinist, anti-Semitic. Everyone is like that. They're horrified by this notion. But if I were to tell the men, you inhabit a world where the structures, the norms, the language, were built around the notion of the inferiority of women and that we still inhabit this world and we and everything we do we need to do against that structure i told them if you were to ignore to ignore that you would be completely blind and that's when they begin to get that civilizational structures are incredibly powerful and the fact that we live in the 21st century doesn't make them disappear it makes it just so much harder to fight against them so all I'm saying is that we need to recognize, we need to be not as naive as Herzl to think that they can just go away. We need to recognize how deep they are, but it doesn't mean that therefore we give up and we do not fight against them. We still need to believe that there is good in people and when they are exposed to the fact of the institutional racism, the institutional chauvinism, the institutional anti-Semitism, they will make an effort to rise above that, and at least some people will, and some people do. Otherwise, I don't think any of us would make any effort at all. And yes, we could be much better at doing that part. Um, <clears throat> I, I think Inat said, said it far better than I ever could, so I'm not going to say very much, um, except for the following. Um, I'm a Jew, so I'm constantly resentful of things, but there are, there are few things that, that I resent more than people who tie the establishment of the State of Israel to either the Holocaust or anti-Semitism. The State of Israel exists because the Jews as a nation have an inherent right to self-determination, period. Period. The Balfour Declaration in 1917 happened long before the Holocaust. We have many instances of declarations of support for Jewish self-determination that happened long before this cataclysmic event in human history. And so the attempt to sort of tie the two, and I think the, the explanations that were made perhaps prior to Israel's establishment that this was a response to anti-Semitism or a cure to anti-Semitism were completely off base. Anti-Semitism will exist probably forever, unfortunately. Um, as Einat said, there are very, very deep roots to it. Um, as, as David suggested, there are uh, perhaps religious roots to that, to it, and so on. It's not going to go away. And I think the expectation that perhaps the establishment of a Jewish national homeland would have done that would have been naive at best. Um, in terms of efforts to uh, combat this, I do agree with, with what Michal said. I think that the efforts need to be quiet, they need to be covert, they need to be behind the scenes. Um, I think that I'm not going to name names, I'm not going to name uh, bodies, but I will say that some of the efforts have been, have been terribly harmful. I will definitely not do that. Um, have been extremely harmful. Um, I think that uh, holding large events and declaring that they are opposed to BDS is, are the exact opposite to Christmas gift of the BDS movement. Um, and we need to be doing whatever we can to make inroads in civil society, build alliances with groups that are like-minded, and, and do so in a sophisticated way. And I think that there are bodies, including government bodies, that are starting to get that and are doing that, um, but we're not there yet. And we need to be a lot smarter about the way we, we combat this phenomenon. By the way, the Shlichtim 
in different campuses from the Jewish agency are doing amazing work and I could see it becoming part of Thank you for that. <laughs> Michal, I agree. Michal, would you like to add anything? Okay, so a, a, a gentleman here asked for a long time, please. Okay. My name is Barry Weiss. Uh, you seem to have gotten hung up on a definition of anti-Semitism. But I'm here because I'd like to see some solutions. And I know there is a, pro a definition, a proper definition of religion. So I throw it to you to see if you can give that proper definition that will lead to peace. If not, you'll have to throw it back to me. <laughs> you mean in a political way? No, a proper definition of religion. And that will, can lead to peace. And if you don't come up with it, I'll tell you what it is. Yeah, just tell us. Is the question clear? Just tell us. Just tell us. Just tell us. Just tell us. Definition of religion. What does it have to do with anti-Semitism? Yes. No, it has to do with getting rid of anti-Semitism, getting rid of BBS, and all the other garbage that's, that's evil. I mean, you, you justified some people saying, I'm a part of BDS. BDS is evil. It's, it's unjust. It's undemocratic. Anti-Semitism is evil. Sir. But the, a proper definition of religion would, can lead to peace, and you'll see why. Well, I hope you come up with it. I think we'll leave it. this I question open for people for a while. Years. I think many people are looking for proper definitions for religion. Yes, a gentleman, the first line, please. No, hold it. I want an answer Barry, from them. Okay. Maybe after the panel? No, I'll give it to you right now. A proper definition, not the dictionary, a system of values which simply guides people's values and behavior. It, the values are important, and those values have to be peace, harmony, tolerance. Human rights, women's rights, and civil rights. Any one of which knock out Islam as a religion. And that's so you remember we spoke about questions, not statements. Okay. Well, they, they will answer my question, and that's why I'm very frustrated that well, once we face what, that Islam is not a religion, but it's an ideology for world domination. Barry, have you ever talked about that? I'm sorry, I will not accept that. Can I answer your question? Absolutely, I categorically reject your characterization of Islam. Okay. Can I answer the question? Yes, then I'll yeah. just give this yeah. gentleman yeah. opportunity to ask, and then I will pass no, the no, mic to you. I'm not taking I'll, I'll pass after the mic to you and to the person that the question will be diverted. I just want to remind you that we are speaking about anti-Semitic, not religions, and I would like also to remind you that we are asking questions, not making statements. Thank you. Um, my question is uh, with regard to uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, Dr. Hirsch said that uh, uh, to his uh, um, uh, recollection, uh, uh, Corbyn is uh, not anti-Semitic, at least not uh, Co consciously, and uh, Dr. Riff uh, um, talked about institutionalized uh, discrimination or uh, racism. Uh, today, in the um, Western left, uh, uh, there's a very prominent view that the uh, Jews are a religion, not uh, um, really a, a people. Um, my question is, is the difference in the definition of Jews between those uh, uh, left uh, uh, leading schools of thought and uh, us as Israelis that do see ourselves as a people, is that the difference that allows them this uh, ability to call themselves anti-Semites because it's just a religion, not a people, therefore not uh, uh, attributing any rights of self-realization um, as a, a national unit. <coughs> okay, so we're still staying on topic of the religion, David. <laughs> So I think it's very important that we think politically. And what we shouldn't do is transform political questions into questions of race or questions of religion. Um, so I think to talk about um, Islam in the way that some people have talked about it. As I said, I remember being in the union and people were talking about Judaism. And the Jews think this, the Jews think that. People. It's well known that anti-Semites become an expert in Jewish theology and they explain that the Jews think they're better than everybody else and they think they're the chosen people and they think that in the Talmud it says this and that and the other. And I think it's very important to resist 
becoming an expert in the theology that we don't understand. And I think it's very important to resist turning uh, political questions into questions of race or questions of religion. I think that the struggle against anti-Semitism should <coughs> resist. We should resist splitting the struggle against anti-Semitism away from the struggle against other forms of racism. And I think we should resist splitting the struggle against anti-Semitism from the struggle against Islamophobia. Because I think that certainly we should be against certain kinds of political movements, but we shouldn't be against certain kinds of religious uh, practice. Islam is practiced differently in every place where it's practiced. It has different politics in every place where it's practiced. And, you know, it's not a theological question. It's a question about politics. <coughs> and we shouldn't, you know, talk about the rise of the Muslims in Europe and the rise of the Muslims here and there. We should talk about political questions. And the political questions is the rise of a political ideology which takes Islam and makes out of it a totalitarian movement in the way that the Stalinists took socialism and made out of it a totalitarian movement in the way that, you know, some people have taken democracy and liberty and made out of it something very, very unpleasant. So we need to, we need to be very clear on that. The question of uh, kind of how to define Jews is, you're right that people use the definition of the Jews that makes them sound good. So the one thing that you mentioned in your book about the difference between beer keller, so beer uh, basement uh, uh, versus bistro kind of anti-Semitism, uh, is true in the sense that there is an element of class. And I would say that Jeremy Corbyn, the reason that he resists the idea of being called an anti-Semite as much as he thinks it is, is also a class element. Anti-Semitism is the ideology of the uninformed, of the lower classes, the, those with the ill will. The, these, this is like the ideology that is not respectable. Anti-Zionism is respectable. Yes. So if I hate Jews via anti-Zionism, I can still engage in the pleasure of hating Jews while re maintaining my class respectability. And I think this is why people resist so much the anti-Semitic title, not because generally it's bad, it's also like, don't put me with these low lives. I'm not the Charlottesville kind of people. I'm an anti-Zionist. It is so much more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a lot, and one of the ways that this is manifested is also by saying, and these are not Jews, and I don't hate Jews because look, these are good Jews. And again, the whole uh, strategy works on separating the bad Zionist from the good Jew. And the good Jew is the one who gives over the pounds of flesh. What are the pounds of flesh? national belonging, uh, a sense of being a people, all of that. Give that over and you are left with something small and you will discover, as all Jews discover, that even that is not enough. But one of the ways that anti-Semitic, anti-Zionists present themselves as respectable is indeed by claiming to make that distinction, but then immediately turning back on it and kind of painting all Jews as Zionists, except for the three Jews who are their academic colleagues and who lead the anti-Zionist boycotts. And those are the Jews that are used for that purpose. And I just have to share with you, one of the things that I've been struggling with is the Israelis, especially the young Israelis who are at the forefront, you know, Mati Pellet's grandson, you talk about this guy in the, the UK, who are at the forefront of this anti-Israel rhetoric. And I'm sure you all know the joke about the guy who was um, uh, basically who didn't uh, who flunked uh, Air Force training. So he goes back to the military training, and they tell him, "Okay, where do you want to go now that you're flunked the Air Force training?" He says, "I want to go to the anti-aircraft unit." 
And they say, and he, he's asked why, and he says, if I don't fly, no one flies. And, uh, and I think this is my explanation for Israelis who do this, is it, it's a certain type of Israelis who, in their mind, Israel changed. And if it's not the Israel that they wanted, no one should have Israel. You know, if Israel is now a country with Mizrahim and Haredim and Mitnachalim, then let it not exist. And the notion of like, if it's not my kind of Israel, I don't want any Israel at all, also fuels that part of um, <coughs> the people who, who are the good Jews. <laughs> I don't have much to say, just uh, that I think that bringing theology into this conflict and religion is not a good idea because it's such a complicated conflict, territorial, ideological, political. And I think that when we bring in Jews versus Muslims, it just complicates it and it makes it more difficult to solve in practical, pragmatic lines. Thank you. We are getting toward the end, so the last question will be given. The floor, the, the floor will be given to the most young representatives that was till now. Please. Um, to uh, David in specific, um, you spoke about voting Labour, for the Labour Party in a kind of pre-general election context. I'm just wondering after the wave of support for Jeremy Corbyn um, in the election in May and a very shaky government at the moment that could fall apart any time, um, how you think this has changed um, and whether now the corbyn McDonnell government being a very realistic possibility if an election is called um, means that a Jew in the Labour Party um, would think you know, differently about voting Labour and also should that happen, I know you have to be you know, very brave to make political predictions now, but would the other panelists see that as like a watershed moment um, in, you know, this kind of idea of the left and anti-Semitism? Should there be a Corbyn government in Britain? So I think one of the things we're seeing is the rise of a populist politics. And it's a politics which is hostile to democracy. It's hostile to um, all of the kind of parts of democracy that we should value. There's a you know, strong critique, which is shared by the Corbynites and by also the, the far right and the Trumpists and the Brexiters and the Islamists. There's a hostility to the idea of law. There's a hostility to the idea of international cosmopolitan institutions. There's a hostility the, the, to the media, the idea that the media is all fake news. There's a whole load of things that are shared across these populist movements. And I think the, pop, the populist movement in 2016 in Britain rose to support Brexit because it wanted to give a kicking mm -hmm. to actually the people who were, however poorly, carrying out democratic politics and people wanted to kick the grown-ups. And Theresa May then came along and she said, I'm a grown-up, I'm going to offer you a, a strong and stable Brexit, I'm going to implement Brexit in a way which will do the least harm, that should work. And people said, no, we don't want you to do that. If we wanted you to do that, we wouldn't have voted for Brexit. Yeah. So they found another way to kick the grown-ups, which was to, to vote for Jeremy Corbyn. And the Brexiters in the North <coughs> voted for Jeremy Corbyn, and the Remainers in London voted for Jeremy Corbyn, because things like Brexit and Corbyn and Trump are kind of empty signifiers. They're things into which we can all pour our own... Uh, dreams and hopes and hatreds and hostilities and resentments. The question of what will happen in the next election is, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the situation is going to be. And I don't know what I'm going to say. I'm sorry. I'd just like to say one thing. Sorry. I think that it's a potential scenario, and I think that Israel, uh, strategically, uh, would do well to consider the current deadlock in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, what's happening in Europe, Brexit, Marie Le Pen, Geert Wilders, all of them, 
and see how, you know, the path that we are going in and the path Europe is going in and to consider, you know, how this ongoing conflict taps into what's happening in Europe, how the changing landscape in Europe is going to affect what's happening here. So definitely not, you know, not to shut not to shut our eyes and say, well, whatever happens, happens. This is it. You pointed out to a, a, a specific thing that's, that's a very real scenario and that Israel would definitely do well to prepare for. So just a very, sorry, very quick question before we move to the trailer that I wanted to show you. Uh, to everyone, I mean, you mentioned that you sat with the Chabad people, students in the Chabad, and they all say that they are moving to Israel. And I also had... They are living in France. Oh, excuse me, they are living in France. Thank you, thank you for correcting me. And um, I also had quite the same experience when I was in uh, Paris, when I spoke with some people, in the Chabad house precisely. And um, my question to everyone would be, um, let's say 15 years from now, do Jews have future in Europe? Um, of course Jews have a future in Europe. Why wouldn't they? <laughs> I increasingly think that Herzl got it right now. Yeah. Jews should be comfortable wherever they want to live. As long as Israel is strong and exists, Jews have a place everywhere in the world. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, David, Einat, Avi, and uh, Michal for joining us. Thank you very much for a uh, productive discussion. And please, before you stand up, three minutes. Next Wednesday, uh, this, Wednesday. This, Wednesday. this Wednesday, yes. David is uh, participating in a, another event. There is going to be a movie about uh, the whole campaign of the Labour Party and how the anti-Semitism was uh, whitewashed there. So I would like to show you the beginning of that movie. I think it's quite good end to the topics that we talked about them today. David also, yeah. people can buy the book for a hundred shekels. I'll uh, even sign it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tomorrow it will be my pleasure and my honor to host an event in the Parliament where our friends from Hezbollah will be speaking. I've also invited um, friends from the rest of the world as well. The idea that an organization that is dedicated towards the good of the Palestinian people and bringing about long-term peace and social justice and political justice in the whole region should be labeled as a terrorist organization by the British government is really a big, big historical mistake. Jeremy Corbyn referred to people in Hamas and Hezbollah, anti-Semitic Jew-killing organizations, as his friends. But even more alarming is that he described Hamas and Hezbollah as movements for peace for the good of the Palestinian people and as movements for justice. He didn't just want to talk to these friends, he positively supports their politics. It is dedicated towards the good of the Palestinian people and bringing about long-term peace and social justice. Now we are told that anyone who says that videos like this show that Labour has an anti-Semitism problem is part of a conspiracy to smear the left. So here we have a situation in the Labour Party where even the most innocuous video can be used to accuse Jeremy Corbyn of anti-Semitism. It's also worrying how such a pathetic uh, evidence can, as we know, can be used to intimidate Jeremy Corbyn into establishing an inquiry commission, in making daily confessions that he's not anti-Semitic, and so on. Friends from Hezbollah, friends from Morassa. Dedicated towards the good of the Palestinian people and bringing about long-term peace and social justice. I'm David Hirsch. I'm a member of the Labour Party and a Mitra Union. 
I read The Guardian, I teach sociology at Goldsmiths <laughs> University of London. This is my world, a world in which racism and bigotry are absolutely taboo. It is astonishing then that in this world, a fight about anti-Semitism came to a head in the spring of 2016. People like Jeremy Corbyn and Ken Livingstone have been on the fringes of the British labor movement for decades. Hostility to Israel and common cause with the murderous enemies of Israelis functioned as key markers of their political identity. Recently, this faction took power in the party and in the unions and in the National Union of Students. Anti-Zionist activists were now in the British mainstream. And anti-Semitic things that they were saying were coming into the public domain. One Labour activist demanded the reopening of the Jewish question. Another said Jews were chief financiers of the Atlantic slave trade. A former parliamentary candidate tweeted that Hitler was the teacher of the Zionists. Labour students were baiting Jewish colleagues, singing bombs over Tel Aviv. And then... Ken Livingston started talking about Hitler. To be continued. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks to the panelists, the guests, and thank you very much to all the sponsors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.